one of the driving forces behind the recent development of research about nonlinear dispersed wave equation. So recently, Professor Koffer and his colleagues introduced uh, new spaces, so-called uh, UPNC spaces, uh, which are very useful for the analysis in the critical, uh, scaling critical space. So uh, he speaks of the spaces in P and GP and global solution to this space. Please. Thank you. Um, and thank you for this opportunity. It's a great honor for me to speak here and actually uh, it had to solve somehow the problem what to speak about and how to present it since it's not so easy for me to speak to such, a, such an audience. Um, I should also say that I wish you a lot of success with your project, this is SGU. Uh, and I should also say that Professor Tsutsume is a name which I connect since a long time to dispersive equations, even when I studied. Um, and uh, so it's nice to be here and an honor to have the opportunity to speak here. Now, connecting to your introduction, so uh, the spaces UP and VP turned out to be useful for dispersive equations. And I started to look at them together with Daniel Tataru. I started maybe doing that about 10 years ago. Uh, and using them, I guess it was originally the idea of Daniel Tataru to use these spaces in dispersive equations, and then it first showed up in a joint paper of us. Later on, I learned that at least the spaces VP had a sort of much longer history, and I'm going to present a bit about that. It was one of the amazing things to learn that, at least in probability and harmonic analysis, they play a certain role. Um, and have been studied independently, uh, as far as I know. Now, I'm going to talk about dispersive equations. So, the things we should have in mind, mind are waves, nonlinear waves, let's say water waves. I copied that from the internet, but I guess it's a picture which fits, which, which fits well to this context. It's not quite what I think I understand anything about, or I don't understand much about it. It's a beautiful picture about a complicated flow, what I want to look at is much simpler. So let's talk about dispersion. Oh yeah, I have to write formulas. And, uh, so um, what we look at is, oh, no. so there's a time derivative. I didn't specify the time and space here. So let's say time is one dimensional and space dimensions. There is a differential operator, which I write in this fashion, which has the effect that after the Fourier transform, this becomes a multiplication. If this symbol is real, then this defines a self-adjoint operator. And the Fourier transform transforms this problem into this one. On the Fourier side, it's an ODE, which can easily be solved. And uh, that gives some information about the solution. OK. What are examples which are of interest? There's the Schrodinger equation, right on linear linear example, the Schrodinger equation, which describes a free particle in quantum physics and in optics, there are nonlinear uh, variants of them, and uh, these are things which I'm also interested in. There is the Erie equation, which is better known as the quarter de Vries equation, but if you drop the nonlinear term, we get a linear differential equation. So in this case, the symbol is C cube, and it's always a challenge to get the signs right, and don't worry about factors of 2 pi and so on. Uh, they won't they depend on conventions. And I'm quite sure that I don't get them always right. So um, the Erie equation, what does it describe? It's a sort of asymptotic equation for water waves in a certain regime. And it describes one-dimensional water waves and was quite famous for um, when Russell Scott, Scott Russell, has seen a wave which, in a channel which survived for a very long time, which was pretty stable. And that was sort of beginning for looking at solitons. I mean, seriously, it started much later when it turned out that this, the quarter vector freeze equation has much more structure, um, which connects applied mass to natural geometry. 
for the moment, typical uh, I present this equation here because of this term, and I want to explain what dispersion is, but let's have some examples in mind first. Then the for personal interests, uh, I want to present the linear cartom circuit Schwili equations. So the nonlinear ones are the one with the nonlinearity here. Um, and then that's it. So x is the direction of the wave. What you see here is again the Cordovic de Vries equation. So x is the direction of the wave, it's one dimensional, t is time, and there is a, another transversal effect by u y y. So that's the second derivative with respect to y here. Um, well, here's the time derivative on this side. I don't, uh, the x derivative on this side. So I'm not going to say much about it. Uh, this the equation, the nonlinear equation describes um, these water waves, which you have seen for the quarter de Vries equation, but it takes into account transversal effects and depending on whether there's surface tension or not, uh, this line is stable or not. Uh, but I'm not going to tell much about it. Then um, the wave equation fits into this framework, but it is different since the wave equation is second order in time. So if you formalize fact formally factorize it into two equations, you get a half wave equation. And then on the level of the symbols, it looks like that, and you get a Fourier multiplier. OK, so these are typical or important examples for. Um, There's a question. If you leave out this nonlinearity, do you have these political effects in the linear equation as well? No. no. I'll just show you pictures and explain that a bit with pictures. I didn't explain what dispersion is yet. Um, now, what is dispersion? Well, from physics, it, it's, I mean, it's not, not really a workable notion, but it's, it's quite good. It says that the group velocity, I mean, the velocity of a wave with a certain, with a certain frequency depends on that frequency. So this has the effect that if you have compactly supported initial data to a Fourier transform, then you get, so you get well, if you start with a, you get a Schwartz function on the Fourier side. And it has different components. Each of them has a different velocity. So it's going to move apart and going to decay. So maybe that answers a bit uh, your question. Uh, and that is true even though on the Fourier side, we, you get a multiplication by something of size 1, point-wise. So the L2 norm is conserved. So even though the L2 norm is conserved, the wave spreads out and decays. So this is one way of defining <coughs> seeing what dispersion is. Maybe a bit more precise is um, if you look at the characteristic set. So if you do a Fourier transform of the dif differential equation, then you get, since it's a differential equation, you get a multiplication. And, oh, sorry. And this multiplication uh, is by tau minus p of c. So this is this function. And it, this is obviously then bad. Awesome. The important part is when this vanishes, because otherwise you get more control and similar to elliptic PDEs where much more regularity is available. So stationary phase then tells that the curvature leads to pointwise decay of the fundamental solution. So for that, one has to look, I mean, the, the fundamental solution, so the solution with initial data at Dirac measure, um, is given by this integral here. Stationary phase tells that, um, so this is an oscillatory integral. So the leading part comes from the point when the phase becomes stationary. So when this is stationary, that is that x divided by t is minus grad p of c. And what you see here is the group velocity is given by the gradient of minus the gradient of p of c. So there is a direct relation between um, the first part and the second part with the characteristic set. And what I discuss here is one gets the decay of the fundamental solution. So these are three things which are directly related. I don't want to define formally what dispersion is. I don't think that this is useful, but this is what I, this effect is what I want to understand by dispersion. OK, now let's look at what we want to describe from what we see. So dispersion. Equations have to do with nonlinear waves. So let's look at waves 
it's fun, and maybe we can learn something about it. So what do we have here? We have a ship, and I've no idea whether what I'm saying now is, is, is the precise explanation. That's not my field, but let me try to tell you what, what I see here, what I want to discuss. So what we see is a ship which moves in the sea. Now, this ship does something to the surface and to the, to the water. It generates a wave. And to me, it looks as if this wave would be mainly linear. But I'll come back to that. Now, what you, it's linear. And probably, if one tries to capture the leading order terms, one gets a dispersive equation where the velocity of a wave depends on its frequency, which has the effect that you're going to see, I mean, first of all, this ship is going to generate maybe stronger waves of certain frequencies than of others. And what you see is you see a frequency pattern. And you see a propagation in some direction. I mean, it's not clear whether it's the correct one, because we have to, would have to look for the frame of coordinates or whatsoever. But what you see is that the waves are going to move, should seem to move at least. There are some interference where certainly Different frequencies play a certain role. So maybe this one goes into that direction, and this one goes into that, or whatsoever. And you see, you see the position. But anyhow, what you see, since there are different, different frequencies have different velocities, is that in different positions in space, you see different frequencies and different overlap, and you see these oscillations. What you also see is that uh, already on this picture, that waves seem to decay. So that's this dispersive effect. Um, and yeah, I guess I like that picture. There's a bit more which we can learn from that. Again, I'm not, quite, I'm not an expert in water waves, but so uh, you have to take that, this with some caution. But if you look at dispersive equations, they don't come from first principles. They are typically come from some sort of asymptotics. And this symbol, which I've presented to you, often comes from a Taylor expansion. So since it doesn't come from first principle, it makes sense to look at uh, different dispersive equations. And they come, there's a large zoo of dispersive equations because it comes, again, from Taylor expansions. And uh, it's better to uh, be not too restrictive about the class of, of equations. But nevertheless, we would like to understand solutions in sort of more general terms. Well, the next, next picture doesn't show anything different. Besides, it's of different origin. That's an attempt by uh, Barry and Bristol. I found it on the internet, so I hope it's, it's OK to present this picture this way. Uh, the text allowed, the text allowed it. Uh, he tried to, so in physics, and tried to uh, find sort of mathematical pattern in the sense that he wants to try to describe, to, to find functions which describe this sort of bow wave of the ship. And the coincidence, I guess, is quite, quite good. Um, this is something. Uh, not the picture taken, but the. No, that's a. But the function. That's a function, plot of a function. So this is maybe something similar. Maybe I'm not quite sure what it, what exactly it is. So it may be a picture of a drop falling into water, and then with a high resolution camera taken, there are some waves which go out. Again, you see certain frequencies, which is some hint that there is some dispersive structure. Um, maybe there is some periodic excitement, because here you see some, some drops. So I'm not quite sure about the contents of the picture. But again, what you see is a pattern of waves. And most of the waves, I would think, are linear, which I have shown you. Um, this is a nonlinear one. Um, so why is, I mean, what is the evidence that it's nonlinear? There are two things. So first of all, you see a sort of periodic structure here in that direction. But um, the shape is not, uh, not like a sine or some complex exponential. And this is supposed to be described by this katomsky fetvier equation, which describes, so I would look at this as being a soliton with some transverse effects. And there may be some interactions. And so uh, and it's, even pos it's also possible to construct solutions to the katomsky fetvier 2 equation, don't worry about these numbers, um, which look like that. So the nonlinearity 
nonlinearity might have different effects. It might either work together with dispersion, and then things die out maybe even faster, or it might work against the dispersion, and then you might get the solitons, and that is maybe some answer of so this is the thing which we would like to understand. Um, and many analysts try to understand these things, typically with equations, not so close to pictures. That's more something for, phys for people from, from physics. But uh, maybe it gives some idea of what we are after. OK. Now, <coughs> let me do a very trivial reduction. So let's think of this as being a matrix. If we want to solve such an equation, we might look at the matrix exponential and conjugate with that and end up with an ordinary differential equation with a very simple ODE, the most basic ODE. And I want to spend some time and talk about this differential equation. So what we have is we have a time derivative of a function given by some other function and some initial data. And what I want to discuss is which are function spaces of interest. Which function spaces should we use? Well, the first observation is that if you have f in L1, so I drop the tilde, then we get roughly a solution u in bv. That's roughly, I mean, after some fine points, that's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Bounded variation. Bounded variation roughly says that the derivative is a measure. So let's say that it's L1 and let's not look at these fine points. So for this differential equation, the space BV plays a special role. The right hand side in L1 space plays a special role. And certainly, uh, U in L infinity or continuous functions or whatsoever bounded, you should have put bounded functions here, plays a special role. I don't want to distinguish between bounded functions and infinity and continuous functions for most of the uh, talk um, for the purpose of the talk. It's mostly this. Now, the guiding question is can we interpolate between L infinity and bounded variations and sort of factorize the operator so to put the PTE into a function space? So it's maybe a rough, a rough idea, maybe a rough construction. But this is basically what works for elliptic PTEs. You can put basically all the information, the sense in which I look at it, into the function space. OK, now, wait a minute. OK. Well, why should that be good? Well, First, if you look at some duality, so there's, there's some duality between functions of bounded variation and the space of ruled functions by a uh, sort of Stiltius integral. So there's a quadratic form. Let's say this function is a ruled function. Ruled functions are bounded functions, basically. I mean, bounded functions which have limits at each point from both sides. So. Um, if you have a ruled function and bounded variation, at least kinetically, there are is some, duality, some duality relation of that type. I have to be careful at some points, but uh, I don't want to do that um, later a little bit. So with that, solve it. That, that requires proper definitions. Okay, but this is the idea. But with proper definitions, this is true. Okay. So, this allow. I mean, if you want to solve this equation with some initial data, then by this duality statement that reduces to estimates of u times f. Uh, with this duality. I mean, if you want to esti estimate um, u in BV by, for some right hand side f, then it. That, and then by duality, we multiply and integrate, and it reduces to estimating objects like that, uh, u times f. Maybe I should have taken a different letter here uh, in the proper function space. So 
Now for dispersive equations, the same thing works, but for a slightly different reason. The reason is that if you look at two things, one, if you solve the linear equation for some initial data and zero right hand side, uh, this is dual to looking at a solution to some right hand side and solving up to time zero. So this duality argument works well for dispersive equations, and I'm sorry, this is a bit maybe not as explicit as, as I would wish, but anyhow, uh, working at, in a duality setting uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, these things occur in probability quite a bit. Um, so there are the probabilistic Ito and Stratonovich integrals, which are, so the B is Brown in motion, F is something else. Um, and Brown in motion roughly has half a derivative. So this is, this has half a derivative. F is typically given by the Brown in motion also as half a derivative. So if you could integrate that, you would have a pathwise notion of these integrals, which we know is not two. So this is a lot of the Eton Sadanovich stuff is pretty close. It's, it's, it's important because you're just on the borderline for this sort of integration with, uh, with duality. Okay, well, there has a lot of, been a lot of progress. So the rough path theory of reliance is one of the places where this VP spaces, the bounded P variation, occurred a lot. And uh, well, then also Haira, I would like to see in that context, even though he moved in a different success direction, a very successful fashion. The, in harmonic analysis, this function of P variation occur in the context of Martingales, in the work of Bourguin, Tau, Thiele, and so on, which is something which I realized much later than when I started with these things. Now what is bounded P variation? So let's look at functions which are defined on R. So in real functions, and first we look at a partition. A uh, partition is given by an increasing sequence of numbers. Let's take finite, a finite number of them, not to have any problems with of analytic type here. And we allow, this is important, that the last one is equal to infinity. So we denote this set of partitions by tau. We denote partitions by small tau. Now, we define a set of functions, which are all step functions, with finitely many discontinuities that play the role of test functions in analysis. But what we allow is that there are finitely many discontinuities, but at this point of the discontinuity, they might have a different value, neither the one from the left nor from the right. Okay, uh, the ruled functions are the those which have left and right limits everywhere, including at plus or minus infinity. So they are bounded because they have limits, uh, and they play the role of distributions to a certain extent. And to fix the notation, we denote the symbol V infinite of infinity always by zero. So that's just a convention. If you have a function space, then reasonable function space, then we put an RC for right continuity. Um, and we want to have the limit zero at minus infinity for the right continuous functions. So this is some convention. And then we look at the something which called, could be called a regulated Stiltius integral. So we put this, we take the function u, which is a step function. We take, um, ah, there's a typo. So this step function here should be right continuous. Um, we put, we take the regulated functions here and we map them at this integral v du, which there's little choice than understand this way. Maybe there is a bit choice because there's the question of left continuity, right continuity, but that's the one which we take. So now we equip, and again, that should be the right continuous functions with the BV norm, which since these are step functions, is simply the sum over the steps. And we equip R with the supremum norm. It's a bounded function. It takes, uh, uh, sorry, it's a bounded function. Uh, we take the supremum norm. 
And if you have a linear map from a gain right continuous is missing to R, then we can define V of t is L evaluated at this step function. If we do that, we get a representation for this linear map, and this identifies then the one has to work. Uh, one gets the duality that this space R is the dual of this space. Uh, well, this is not, not a closed space, but anyhow, this is the dual space then. Okay. Now, what are functions of bounded p-variation with this preparation? So, p-variation is with some, variation would be with sum over the chums, so we take a partition, sum over the chums. Now, we take the p-th power of it and take a 1 over p and take the soup over all partitions. That's the p-variation, contrast with one variation whatsoever. There are limits, left and right limits everywhere. That's not hard to see, so we stay in the context of this regulated functions. Um, and let's say an important example is that uh, a function which is zero as if the argument is non-zero and one if the argument is zero. So that's a function which we don't identify with zero which is one of the differences to um, work with, if you work with LP functions or if you work with uh, distributions or whatsoever. Now, Young, I guess 1912, introduced an integral, so he asked for this function to be also continuous. So if you're on this setting that 1 over P plus 1 over Q is larger than 1, then, um, Yes, this bound. Improve this bound. Uh, again, Brown in motion is almost certainly in VP, or P larger than 2. If it were new 2, so which is, which is going to go below, but if it were a little better, then there would be no stochastic integration because everything would be pathwise. Um, and basically, the same is then true for, for Martin Gills. Uh, there's the obvious embedding, VP is in VQ if Q is larger than P. Okay. Now, one statement which I don't want to explain why this is true, but it plays a role later on. If you take a test function with integral zero, if you convolve with F, then we get into LP. If you think about it, for those who know that, that implies that this VP, functions in VP have, in some sense, 1 over P derivatives, and they lie in a certain Bessock space, and that is something which makes the whole theory work later on. Okay, so this is VP, which maybe I should go back. So this, this is a Brown in motion, was the starting point for Terry Lyons in order to get his rough path theory, this, this young integral. One in motion is in VP for P larger than 2. Um, but obviously, he needed some other non-trivial ingredients. But nevertheless, this was the starting point. Now, um, we need a different class of functions, also the UP, um, which play, which are important for duality. Now, what are they? Well, let's start with simple functions, with P atoms. What is a P atom? A P atom, oh, there's again a typo. A P atom is a right continuous function, so this should denote this closed interval here and the open interval there. So, what we take is we look at we look at functions which so they look like that. The last one might extend to infinity. Now, it is a p atom if the p's power of the coefficients sum up to 1, or less or equal to 1, that doesn't matter. And then that space of up, and this is an important point, consists of all. Break up one of the intervals, it wouldn't be long to the intervals. So one really has to make these intervals as large as possible. Well, if you would break up the intervals, you would get something larger. 
it would still, if you do it finitely often, you would still get something which is close to a p atom, but it would not be a p atom. So this p atom is something of size one. It's, it's to be thought of as size one. Now we look at an atomic space, which means that we look at linear combinations of p atoms. And uh, so these are different p atoms with some lambda j, and then we define the norm as the infimum over all sums of the coefficients uh, in these representation. Um, well, it's not hard to check that up then is a subspace of vp. And if q is larger than p, if we take a right continu continuous function in vp, then we get into uq. So you should think of this function uq and v up and vp as being pretty close. They're not the same. Um, they're not the same, and the counter example for, to show that they're not the same are pretty much the examples which show in that you need a stochastic integral if you want to do stochastic integration. Um, now, what comes next? Then, by definition, the right continuous step functions are condensed in UP, which is trivial. And UP is dense in the right continuous functions are with the supremum norm. The nice thing about an atomic space is the following. If you have an operator, linear operator, linear map, continuous map from UP to some Banach space X, then you get a nice expression of the norm. So the norm of this object is equal to the supremum over the norms if you apply t, if you apply them to, to an atom. The reason is simply, I mean, it, it's almost trivial. If you apply t here, you get tu is the sum of t times lambda j a j. So you drop the lambda j out, take the absolute value of that. And the sum of the lambda j is going to be the norm, the norm, the norm of the u. So this is almost trivial, but uh, it is a very useful observation. Now, let me come to duality. So, uh, again here, there should be an RC. I dismissed that consistently. If you look at this, this VP, this sits in R. So we did define this pairing here for these functions. And it ex extends to a continuous bilinear map on VP times uq, 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1, and has this duality. And this is, uh, it, it defines an isometric bijet map from vp to uq star to the dual map. So that's a, that, that is the duality. Um, well, how do we get a representation? We simply evaluate L at this characteristic function, which is an atom. So, and then, gives this, this function. Now, what do we have to prove? Well, if you believe me that this gives a function in, um, in R, then one has to check the norm. But checking the norm, the, 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 I mean, what, what one has to do is one has to prove that the uh, VP norm of V is bounded by the norm of this operator L. But that involves uh, looking at the definition, so that here you look at the p variation, so you look at, at a partition. If you look at this partition and choose an appropriate atom, then you get the bound of v in vp. And similarly, if you want to prove that this bilinear map is well defined, it suffices to check on an atom. But on an atom, you get a sum. You get a sum by definition, the sum over V of Ti, U of Ti minus U of Ti minus 1. But this is nothing else than the sum over V of Ti minus V of Ti plus 1 times u of ti, it has to pay attention to what happens at infinity. So now, 
that's a finite sum. So now you estimate that in LP and that in LQ. If you have an atom, then the letter is, gives one and this gives the, this bound. Okay, so now we have all the duality at our disposal. Um, I've told you that if you look at the right continuous functions, I mean, we have this convolution, we get into that space, UP sits into that, so the dual statement is that, uh, I mean, it's not clear why it's, it's, there's a derivative in this bilinear form involved, so uh, there's this Bessel space here, uh, this, this here on this side. Uh, so in some sense, these function spaces have one over P derivatives, um, and can be related to the of spaces, which I don't want to discuss in detail here. But this also connects later on these spaces to the full restriction spaces of Bougain, um, which I don't want to talk uh, a lot about. And if one works with a duality, one can see that the step functions are also dense in VP, which otherwise I don't know how to prove. Okay. Now, we have to make contact to dispersive equations. So first of all, in all what I presented, we can look at Hilbert space valued functions without any difficulty. Or we look, can look at functions which take values in Banach spaces and then take dual, dual spaces and so on. There's no harm in doing that. So I omit the value L2 here. Um, and then what we do is we do the same thing now in the opposite direction we did before. So we reduce this equation to an equation with a time derivative equal by equal to some f. So we undo that, and that implies to looking at up uh, functions and apply this operator to it. So look at what it what it means. Uh, then atoms correspond to piecewise solutions. So we simply undo thing which I discussed in the beginning. Okay, now I have to tell you how we connect with notions in dispersive equations. So we look at a dispersive equation, which again, quite like this. Maybe I should have sticked to a capital P here. Sorry for not doing that. And I also omit, but in order to make this reasonable, I omit the index p here on this side. <laughs> so, uh, otherwise, it would look a bit funny. So suppose, if I talk for, about a free wave, I mean a solution to this equation with homogeneous right-hand side, the zero right-hand side here with some initial data u0. So suppose, suppose you have an estimate which tells you that for the free wave, you get some estimate of LP, so the P integral over that with values in a Banach space X. Suppose you get an estimate like that. Then this immediately implies that you get the same estimate that you can, that you can replace U by the UP space. So no equation here anymore. You simply can put the UP space. Why is that the case? Well, I told you that in order to estimate a linear operator from an UP space, it suffices to look at an atom. Now, if you look at an atom, then you have a piecewise solution. You have this picture, and in each part, you have a solution which I draw constant. Now, on each of these intervals, uh, you, so you get a sum of these things. Now, it suffices prove the estimate for a solution starting from here and going up to here, and then adding things up because of the definition of the p-atom. So it suffices to look at, um, at a solution starting at, let's say, at zero and going to infinity because that makes things only larger. But this is exactly what you have for the free wave. So the step is to go from a general function to an AP-atom, and instead of looking at a p-atom, it suffices to look at one piece, because this you can add, add that up by the definition of the atom. And if you look at this piece, you make, make it larger by going to the full space. You might also go backward. It doesn't 
doesn't really matter, and then you add the free weight. So the Strichard estimates immediately imply um, the synthetics. Now, I want to, the end, want to present a toy problem to, to show you how this applies to uh, nonlinear dispersive equations. And I guess I have to sort of apologize to those of you who know these things because I mean, this is really a toy problem and there, there are people in the audience who know that so well that uh, maybe it's a shame that I tell it. But okay. So it's a model problem and I've chosen it in order, not for its relevance, I don't know whether it's relevant, uh, but because it shows what I want to present in a fashion which is as simple as possible. So we look at solutions to this problem. Uh, here the bar is important. We take the square, we take one derivative, we do it in R2, we could do it in higher dimensions, but uh, what I say is more relevant in two dimensions. Um, with initial data, Q0. <coughs> and the theorem is small data result, but anyhow, there exists some epsilon larger than zero, so that when the initial data is less than epsilon, there ex exists a unique global in time solution U. It's a small data, but it's global in time. It implies scattering and all these things. So I think there is some interest in it, partly because the arguments generalize. So they generalize, I mean, I should say that you can rescale this, this problem. There's some rescaling here which I don't want to present, but this leaves the L2 norm here invariant. So, um, in, so this epsilon has sort of absolute meaning here, uh, which is even survives the symmetries of this problem. And this is what you have to do if, in order to prove um, scattering, let's say scattering tells you that for large time you see essentially a free wave not one of the nonlinear problem, but one of the linear problem. If you want to prove something like that, then we have to go into this setting, at least if you are in an L2 context. Okay, so for KP2, in uh, the equation which I presented, the first, first example, my knowledge where this procedure has been worked out, and it works much the same, but there's minus half, one half derivative of initial data in L2 with respect to X, don't worry about that. Uh, so for in one dimension higher, it's the same which works. It works for Klein-Gordon <coughs> equations with quadratic nonlinearity. Just to then quite, so, so this, you're saying the theorem generalizes to all these five other cases. You have the, the you have to do so, to be small for that. Yeah. Right well, you have to take a different expressions in order to be scale invariant. And you have, might have to do a bit more, but what I want to say is that the structure, the rough structure, is the same. And these things are more complicated, but the rough structure is the same. So control of initial data implies global existence. And con control, so if we have small data. Um, I should say the KDV, the quarter victory freeze equation itself is different. The scaling space for KDV has minus three over two derivatives. The best well portion is this result is with uh, minus three over four derivatives. One might expect that there is this well positiveness in H with minus one derivative, but certainly not with H. One knows that they can, one cannot reach minus three over two. There are common examples. So this is different, and the consequence of that is that for KDV, it is, in some sense, much harder to get a global understanding of solutions. I mean, there is inverse scattering and all these things, which, which give a lot of information. But if you want to stick to PDE tools, uh, you get some sort of long-range scattering. There is something visible even for large time from the initial data. And even that, I'm not quite sure whether it has been shown. I'm sure that it's correct, but I'm convinced that it's correct, but I'm not quite sure whether, whether it has been shown. Um, and, and the smallness assumptions in weighted spaces. So you have to do something different. If you look at cubic equations, the cubic nonlinearity, then typically uh, things are a bit simpler in some sense. There's no modulation needed, but I will come to that later on. Well, now I have to walk you through 
the standard techniques with dispersive equations. So the standard thing is a little bit purely decomposition. What is that? Well, we decompose a function. We take lambda power of two, and we define the frequency localized part of that. That's also always with respect to x. Uh, so if you take the Fourier transform, which is indicated by this hat, then we get it by taking the Fourier transform of the function and multiplying it by the characteristic function. So this has then, this, this part has frequency localized around lambda, and if we add them up, we get the <coughs> back. And then we take the following norm in which we want to construct a solution. So that's the space-time norm. Which I don't, which is a suppress here. We take the little wood Paley pieces and put them into V2 and take the square sum of that. Um, so, with that definition, it is immediate that um, if you solve the initial value problem, we get into that space because, I mean, this amounts to looking at the, taking the atom, which simply starts here and go to infinity and, and, and scale that. So there's nothing here. And then I told you that duality is an important point. What we are going to prove is that this tree linear expression here is bounded by a constant times this object x. And this is the, what the duality argument gives. Uh, so you, duality, you multiply the u bar squared by something, and I did, should put the dx1 here, the derivative which I omitted, for reasons which I shouldn't have done that, but, but, but there are reasons for, for me omitting that. Uh, so you do this three linear, three linear object. You basically forget about the derivative. It plays a role of scaling, but let's not worry about that here. Um, and then the role of all functions is the same. So now this reduces, this technique reduces the construction of the solution. I mean, from there, you do get a bound of the nonlinearity in terms of this functions x, and then any iteration argument is going to give you the result which I stated. So you things boil down to moving three linear estimates, no PDE directly involved here. That's all the, all the, always with respect to function spaces. So now let me come to modulation. Now the things get more fun, I guess. So we decompose to the frequencies we sum, and then we have to look at terms of that object of that, that type. So, if we do a Fourier transform, what will you get? If we do a Fourier transform, then this product becomes a convolution. So we get a convolution of three terms, and in order to get some, something in the end at zero frequency, all these have to add up to zero. So that's for the frequencies with respect to x and to xy, so if we do a Fourier transform. Okay, let's see what that means. Well, let's look at the case first that we have two points on the parabola. So we have tau1, tau2, and then if they add up, up to zero, then, so there are three things, so we, we start with that. If they add up to zero, this is the zero, then the third time, so the tau is the time Fourier variable now. Um, so this is the Fourier variable for x, this is tau. Uh, then if they add up to zero, then tau three has to be minus tau one minus tau two. C three, which lives in R two, is minus C one minus C two. So this is what we have to look at. Now let's look at how far, how, how large this is. So how far the result is from the characteristic set. So we look at tau minus xi3 squared. Uh, tau 3, so we look at that, it's, it's xi1 squared minus xi1 squared minus xi2 squared minus xi1 plus xi2 squared. And this is remarkable. I mean, it tells you that if you have two points on a parabola, and if you add them up, you get far away from the parabola. How far in vertical distance? This is given by this expression here. 
and it is as, as large as it could possibly be. It's a sum of three terms. So you get, you're getting Okay, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that if we, if we decompose these objects on the Fourier side into parts which are close to the parabola and parts which are far from the parabola, we don't get anything if everything is close to the parabola. So at least one of them has to be far away. So. Okay, let's decompose it. Uh, So, I guess I some, have some duplicate things here. So at least one of the terms has to have high modulation, by which I mean large vertical distance, at least of size lambda over three above the parabola. So let's say everything is symmetric. The worst case is if it's, if it's the low frequency. I mean, what we have is, let's say we have the situation that this is a low frequency, so we order things according to their frequencies. Uh, so since things have to add up to zero in C, the two largest frequencies have to be the same, otherwise they could not add up to zero. So we are roughly in the setting that we have one frequent, low frequency and two large frequencies. At least one of the terms has to have high modulation, which means large distance, support large distance from the parabola. So let's say this is this term here. Okay. Now then we estimate it by Cauchy-Schwarz. We put that into L2. This high modulation part and this other part here. And I'm going to explain what we do with that. Well, if you look at the high modulation, well, I guess, again, there should be an RC here, which is not so important. If you have high modulation, then um, we get good L2 estimates. That was the embedding which I've shown you in the beginning. The gain on the L2 level, ah, uh, should be E2 here. So sorry for this misprint, there's E2. Um, by this embedding, we get, so we are we at about distance lambda squared from the parabola, and we gain about half of it because we have half a derivative, so we get lambda to the minus one here. <coughs> lambda in this lambda to the minus one. So, if you look, if you're a bit more careful, then we even get this estimate that we can, so that we can sum over this, uh, the low frequency parts, we can sum over these frequencies. Okay, so this is the high modulation. The high modulation tells you. There's a square missing, yeah. Sorry, there. Yeah, the was unfortunately. So that's the first ingredient in the proof. There are, um, there's one part where we are far away from the characteristic set and that we put into L2. That leaves us with a problem of estimating this object in L2. Now this is not hard here because we could simply use the Strichert's estimates for those who know that I roughly mentioned that in the beginning but not, not, not thoroughly. Um, but we have also to look at the case when the high modulation is on some other part and then we have some low frequency and high frequency, and we have to estimate that in L2. Let me tell you what that amounts to. And then I conclude, so that's the Strichert's estimate. So the Strichert's estimate for the free wave is L4. This is the initial data, so that gives the embedding with U4. And here I did put the P, I don't know why, for the operator. Um, and for the other part, we need a bilinear refinement, which tells us that we have, if we have some object on low frequency and some on high frequency, we gain the square root of the quotient of the frequencies uh, if we take the guys into U2. Forget about the difference between U2 and V2 for the moment. It can be handled. But this is the bilinear estimate and this completes the proof. Now, to conclude, I want to say a bit about the bilinear estimate. I don't want to give details, but I want to say what it, what it is about. So what we do is we estimate a product in L2. 
And I've told you, with the UP spaces, we can reduce things to free waves. So we have two solutions to our equation. We have two solutions is equal to zero, I dt v plus lambda v is equal to zero. Well, let me put the frequencies here. Since I don't have this on the blackboard, uh, on the slide anymore, it doesn't matter where I put it. So we think of this as frequency localized, and we think of that as being much smaller than lambda. It doesn't really matter. Okay, what we want to estimate is we want to estimate this u mu v lambda in L2 by constant times mu divided by lambda to the power of one half times u lambda at time zero in L, no, I guess I should be consistent here at least e lambda at times zero in L2. So what is the type of this estimate? Well, if we do a Fourier transform, then we see that uh, the Fourier transform in space and time this time is supported on the parabola. This is equal to zero, so we have a multiplier which is given by the parabola, then this is supported by what we have is, we have the convolution of two functions whose Fourier transform is supported on, on the surface. We have to look at L2 estimates of that type. Now, if you do that, so we have a convolution. So what you look at is you look at, now, now let me combine tor and xi into one variable, which I'm going to call xi again, and I omit the hat. So we are looking at estimates where we want to estimate the convolution in L2 by, well, how should I put it? Maybe I, maybe I shouldn't have written it this way. It's less, so let's say here we have some expressions in terms of surface densities. Surface. Now, what this amounts to is, and you have to write it down, I don't want to do it because I'm running out of time and because I don't want to make things too technical, but what happens is something very geometric. So you have to look, evaluate it at a point C and have to look at where it comes from on the surfaces. So you look at um, points um, which correspond to the support of U, points which support on the support of V, which add up to a given point, and you want to put it in L2, and then you do Cauchy-Schwarz and co-area formula and all these things, and you end up with an expression which can be handled, which gives this bilinear estimate. So this is very geometric in nature, but I'm running out of time to present that. I planned not to present. <laughs> so, well, what I presented to you is a general procedure with a sort of geometric viewpoint once we have these spaces. Um, obviously, it doesn't always work, but when it works, it gives some nice results and it gives global results and scattering and all these things. Things get easier when the space dimension becomes higher. I don't want to explain why. Uh, and higher powers of the nonlinearity are again typically easier for reasons which I don't want to get into. In one space dimension that I've shown you, the results are necessarily weaker. So it's much harder to get scattering in one space dimension because waves don't have as much space to go to uh, than in higher dimensions. Here is a list of things where I know that these techniques have been applied. Maybe there's no need to go through them. There are also open questions or questions in connection with uh, research in related areas like wave maps and so on. Uh, and that is, if there are resonances, I can't explain, but let's say if the modulation, if you, to, if you get back to the characteristic surface, or if you have other bad structures, then you get stronger interactions. And sometimes the spaces have to be refined. It 
cards for wave maps and Schrodinger maps. Yeah, one also has to do other very non-trivial things in order to handle them. But it is not quite clear to which extent resonant situations can be handled by, by these spaces. I could give an example where I'm able to handle things by these spaces or by, by related things, but where I'm lost as soon as I deviate from it a little bit. Thank you for the attention. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. Uh, for example, in, in the scaling critical case, so sometimes uh, data of spaces are used sometimes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think some people are wondering why UTD DB space were more used than data of space. Can you explain to me? I think so. So if you want to get to this critical space, then there are the XSB spaces. I don't want to go into that, but you're forced to take half a derivative. And then what you get is this Bessoff space with half a derivative. I put a dot here for the homogeneous one. Ignore it if you don't. <coughs> so then there is this uh, exponent two, because we are in our two base spaces. And then there is the sum up over the Paley little wood pieces. And this thing is embedded into mu2. This is embedded into, that's into the right continuous functions. And here you get to infinity. So now you have a situation when the Strichard's estimates lead to embeddings on this side. And the dual of that, if you solve the equation with a given right-hand side, you get into that, say, that side. And the difference between the two is going to make your life hard sometimes. If you look at these spaces, then you do get at least most of the Strichard's estimates and the dual estimates for both of them. There's a problem with the end point. This works only for that one or brings you into that one. Uh, you get all the Strichard's estimates and you also get bilinear, bilinear estimates and all these things. So there are problems when you can work with these spaces. The quarter KDV equation is an example of that. But even then, if you work with these spaces, then um, you have to ha handle many more cases in the estimates. Because this is much closer to duality. So with the duality, all terms play roughly the same role. Terry Tau was able to get for the quadric KDV equation uh, to get the solutions in, in corresponding to this space. But you do have to deal with many, with much fewer terms if you take, take this guy. Hope that this answers. Thank you for a clear results on uh, real interpolation spaces between BV and L infinity. And so I was wondering, like, you know, in the style of Lorentz spaces, mm. PQ replacing L mm. spaces, mm -hmm. I was wondering whether this could be useful to you. I'm thinking in particular to replace VP by weak little LP instead of the little LP norm mm. that is used for the P variation. Mm. This space actually is an interpolation space. I was wondering whether this might be interesting. Well, this is an interpolation space, but my impression is you, if you use real interpolation, you don't get to those spaces. If you use, if you use real interpolation, I, I'm not sure, but my impression is you don't get to these spaces. So when I mentioned you do, that's the point. Yeah, of yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. And the pre dual then would be a U P1 space, which yeah. has a very I much know. more atomic structure even. I know, I know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know that. Maybe that's not useful. To but I'm, while I was thinking about interpolation, and my impression was that these spaces don't interpolate well. I may be wrong, but my, my impression is that they don't. Maybe. The, 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 and the reason is if you, maybe one reason is there's a mixture between taking Suprema and LP. And somehow interpolation doesn't seem to. Do you like that? Spaces, 
are identified here. That's, that's what we mean. With this, well, well, if you take the weak space, yeah, I agree with that. And then if you don't, you, they're, they are different, but they're identified. Okay, so. They behave very much like VP. Sure, you get pretty close, but it's, it's interesting to talk to talk about that. So I, don't, I haven't seen it in the literature, so I mean, you know certainly more about that than, than me, but when I tried to think about it, I didn't came, come to anything. I have a very off-topic question for me. So you mentioned at some point that KDB is slightly different from the others. In the very beginning, that KDB is interesting to even algebraic geometries, and that's because it's integral, right? Yeah. So of course, this is very different from what you're doing, but are there some so some hope for some kind of mixing to get new information by using these um, kind of function space approaches and infinity? <laughs> well, let me allow me to put the question more general, general. So is there any way of, let's say, I mean the KDV equation is interesting because of its connection to algebraic geometry and also because its structure and as PDE and because of inverse scattering. Is there a way of bringing these things closer together? So when I talk, I mean, Katharina Stroppel at Bonn asked me once about KDV and wanted to tell me things about, she's interested in KDV, but I didn't understand anything about it, and I couldn't say anything about it. But I do think that, uh, there, that it is use, maybe useful to combine PDE techniques and inverse scattering techniques a bit. I'm not sure about algebraic geometry. <laughs> I mean, the integrable, uh, let's say, combining the integrable structure and the PDE structure, that could be of interest. And, and there are some potential, I think. Thank you. Okay. So, any other questions or comments? If not, okay, that's time to speak again.